Today we have the two V's, Vigano and Vatican II. Vigano just put out a statement. As you know, he wrote a letter to President Trump on Sunday, and then he got back on the keyboard and he issued another statement really as a commentary on the pontificate of Pope Francis through the lens of Vatican II. And he explains how his understanding of Vatican II has changed, and he points out the problems. And really, I would call this new document that he just put out a criticism or a critique of the hermeneutic of continuity. Last week, I did a show with Matt Gaspers, and we talked about the problems of the hermeneutic of continuity. Real quick before we pray, hermeneutic continuity is we can interpret Vatican II. That's hermeneutic means interpret, interpretation. We can interpret Vatican II in continuity with the past 2,000 years. So every time you see something kind of weird in Vatican II, you just sort of wrestle it and massage it and remold it so that it sounds like it's in continuity for the last 2,000 years. But as Vigano has found, as I have found since really 2016, 2017, that is a hard process. You get tired as a theologian, as a Catholic, trying to make these things work. And so we're seeing more and more people hop off the horse of hermeneutic con of continuity and say, no, we need to actually look at the Second Vatican Council, look at the Novus Ordo Liturgy, and give some real assessment. And that's precisely what Archbishop Vigano does in this letter. Now, the letter is pretty long, and I have I've got it in front of me. I've highlighted the key passages. I'm going to read you the most important passages and then make some commentary along the way so you understand what's going on uh, in Vatican II, in Vigano's mind, and then I'll provide some of my own analysis. Before we get started, I want to welcome everyone and ask you, if you would, please like the video before we get started and also share this video on Facebook. The like button and the share button are right there together underneath me. So please share and like it. If you're new, please subscribe. I am live right now and we do these live videos um, at different times now, uh, just based on schedule. So if you want to be notified whenever we go live, and you want to hear videos like this, hit subscribe, hit notifications on. All right, we're going to pray now. I know the Archbishop Vigano topic and all the President Trump things there's a lot of a new audience uh, coming to the Taylor Marshall show. I've noticed a lot of evangelical Protestants are now interested in what Archbishop Vigano is saying. So it's a it's a great moment for Catholics because you have a president retweeting Vigano and endorsing his message. Thumbs up for that. And it's not just a crazy archbishop or cardinal like a soup bitch or something like that. This is a rock solid archbishop who was the Apostolic Nuncio to Washington, D.C. So he was the ambassador for Pope Benedict and for a little while, Francis, to Washington, D.C., to the United States. So uh, that's all the housekeeping. I'm going to pray now. We're going to pray the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. And uh, about 40% of this audience is non-American. So uh, we pray this in the language of the church, one of the three languages that was on the cross of our redemption at Golgotha. Hebrew, Greek, well, some people say Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. We're praying today in Latin, the Our Father, Oremus. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Patra noster, qui es in celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniant regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panam nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos amalo. Amen. Almighty God, please let the stream go well. Open our hearts, draw us closer to Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Real quick, who is Archbishop Vigano? He is an archbishop who first helped clean up a Vatican Bank scandal under the pontificate of Pope Benedict XVI. He got in trouble, obviously, with the people in the Vatican uh, governorate. And Benedict reassigned him to Washington, D.C., where he's a nuncio. And he uncovered even more scandal and problems in the American hierarchy. He blew the whistle in 2018, which led, which was part of a, a whole group of things that happened to uh, displace 
Cardinal McCarrick as the kingmaker in the United States hierarchy. Uh, since then, the Pope has removed Cardinal McCarrick's status as a cardinal, and Archbishop Vigano has been living in hiding ever since. And he's been sending out these notes, these letters to Catholics in the world, most recently to President Trump. And now this new one on what people could argue is the Catholic topic of the past 60 years. And that is, what's up with Vatican II? What's going on with Vatican II? I'm going to read this note. And I want to welcome everybody coming in just now. Uh, we're covering the letter that Archbishop Vigano wrote on June 9th. It's the Feast of St. Ephraim. He, Ephraim was a Syrian deacon and uh, wrote many beautiful poems and songs in defense of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Ephraim was writing against the Arians. The Arians were writing uh, songs, popular songs, that refuted, denied the divinity of Jesus Christ. And so St. Ephraim wrote songs that defended the divinity of Christ. Also, for those of you that aren't Catholic, St. Ephraim is one of the earliest uh, witnesses in church history uh, to devotion to the Virgin Mary and also seeing the Virgin Mary as being exempt from the uh, from original sin, what we Catholics call the Immaculate Conception. So he's an important saint, and uh, Archbishop Vigano always identifies his letters with the date and then with the saint of that day. So this is St. Ephraim. So he begins by referring to His Excellency Bishop Athanasius Schneider. Now, if you watch my channel, you know I am the biggest fan of Athanasius Schneider, and I was blessed last year when I wrote the book Infiltration. Athanasius Schneider, His Excellency, wrote the foreword to that book. And also, this book, if you want to learn about who Vigano is, there's a whole section in this book on Vigano and how he is one of the chief, perhaps maybe the most important, whistleblower against the financial and moral corruption in the Catholic Church right now. Vigano knows more than anyone, well, besides the bad guys, about the infiltration that has happened inside the Catholic Church. So he begins by referring to a to an essay by Bishop Athanasius Schneider, and he says this. This is Vigano. This is the first paragraph of Vigano's letter. His Excellency, Athanasius Schneider, study su summarizes with clarity that distinguishes the words of those who speak according to Christ and the objections against the presumed legitimacy of the exercise of religious freedom that the Second Vatican Council theorized, contradicting the testimony of sacred scripture, the voice of tradition, as well as the Catholic magisterium, which is the faithful guardian of both. Okay, so what's going on here? At Second Vatican Council, uh, there was a modification Vigano calls it a contradiction, and I agree with him, that humans have a right to religious freedom. Now, you might think, well, yeah, that kind of sounds right. I like that. Now, here's the problem. Rights are not something that we humans create and give to one another. That's, that's the French Revolution. The state creates rights and then divvies them out. No, that's very bad. We don't want to believe in that. What we believe as Christians and what's in the Bible any right we have, which is really just the flip side of a duty, every right that we have is given to us by God, the right to life, for example. So rights come from God, which means all rights would be in conformity with what God wills and teaches. So someone can't say, I have the right to be a Satanist. Does that make sense? Because you're saying that God Almighty gave me this right to worship Satan. See, that's a problem. You can't say, I have the right to worship Hindu idols. I have the right to that freedom. No, you don't. Because the first commandment, which was given by God Almighty, says, Thou shalt have no gods before me, or graven images of false gods. You can have images, photographs, statues of people you admire, your mom, your dad, your daughter, uh, a great uh, military leader, a saint. That's why we Catholics have statues of saints. But you can't have statues of false gods. That's idolatry. So you can't come and say, I have that, that, that right. Well, Vatican II, it would seem, and this has been articulated by Francis, and we'll get into that a little bit, says, no, no. 
Muslims have the right to uh, worship Allah and reverence Muhammad. Jews have the right to reject Christ as the, as the Messiah. Hindus have the right to worship Shiva, Vishnu, whatever. Uh, Satanists, I guess, by extension, this has never been stated, Satanists have the right to have uh, idols of Satan and bow before them, pour blood on them, whatever they do. I don't know. So this is a, a very important point in the last 60 years. This At the council, this was a highly debated topic. There were many who did not agree with this. What, there's also a debate with Archbishop Lefebvre, whether he signed or he didn't sign. I'm not going to go into that today. Just know there was resistance in the 1960s, 1965, when this went down. Now, Archbishop Vigano goes on to say this. The merit of His Excellency's essay lies, first of all, in its grasp of the causal link between the principles enunciated or implied by Vatican II and their logical consequent effect in the doctrinal, moral, liturgical, and disciplinary deviations that have arisen and progressively developed to the present day. So Vigano is saying, look, with Athanasius Schneider, I agree that there is or there are rather principles in Vatican II that lead to deviations in four categories. Let me give you those, give you those again. Doctrine, morality, liturgy, discipline. This is why when you go to a Catholic church in 2020, it doesn't look like, sound like, feel like a church from 1950, 1850, 1750, all the way back. Something has changed and the people who promote Vatican II, say it has changed and they think it's a good thing, which we'll get into. Vigano then goes on to say, the monstrum generated in modernist circles could at first could have at first been misleading, but it has grown and strengthened so that today it shows itself for what it really is in its subversive and rebellious nature. The creature that was conceived at that time is always the same, and it would be naive to think that its perverse nature could change. Attempts to correct the conciliar excesses invoking the hermeneutic of continuity have proven unsuccessful. This is my own experience. For 10 years, I was trying to make Vatican II fit to make it work. I was on Catholic Answers, conferences. We would do this kind of thing. But once we got into Pope Francis and he's constantly citing the documents for things like idolatry, at this point, you're like, no, there was, as he says, a creature that was conceived in the 1960s. Then he's, he quotes uh, Horace, the Latin author in Latin, Naturum expellus furca, tamen usque recurrit. That is, drive nature out with a pitchfork, she comes right back. So, he says, the Abu Dhabi Declaration, as Bishop Schneider rightly observes, its first symptoms in the pantheon of Assisi was conceived in the spirit of the Second Vatican Council as Bergoglio proudly confirms. Two observations here. The Abu Dhabi, docu Abu Dhabi document is by Pope Francis. It is a declaration that God wills the diversity and plurality of religions, which is heresy and incorrect. God only wills one religion, the religion of his son, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. That is the Catholic faith that's been around for 2,000 years. There's only one true Christian faith. There's not three or four or 36,000. There's one church, one faith, one baptism. So that's an error. But then he says it's first symptoms in the pantheon of Assisi. He's referring to the 1986 meeting of John Paul II at Assisi, where he invited the Dalai Lama, Native American shamans, all these religions to pray in a Catholic church. He gave them the Catholic church to perform their idolatrous rites inside of our sanctuary. So we see Pope Francis doing things that are radical, but we also see this going on with John Paul II in Assisi 1986. Here is a connection that I made in my book, Infiltration. When I put the book, Infiltration, out, I thought I was going to get raked over for what I said about John Paul II. I brought up the 1986 Assisi meeting 
And I also brought up some things he did in 83, 84, 85. I showed that there was a shift in John Paul II's understanding with the world in, a, in 1983, is what I say in Infiltration. And then in 1986, we have open idolatry in one of the greatest shrines in the Catholic Church, the Basilica of Assisi, St. Francis' church, where St. Francis is buried. I thought everyone, you know, everyone loves John Paul II. I thought people were going to come after the book on that point. And no one really has. Everybody's come after my critics and people who trash the book. They're all uh, upset about the Freemasonry part. I mean, it seems pretty clear that there's been Freemasonry and secret societies infiltrating the church and the state for over 200 years. I, I mean, especially if you don't believe it. If you didn't believe it last year in, two, in 2020, it's obvious. And you have President Trump retweeting it. So this is a point I made in the book. I guess people just didn't bother them. They just went through it. But Viganos making the same point here. Look, some of this stuff started as early as John Paul II, even before that, actually. So then in the letter, I'm going to skip a little bit here. Archbishop Vigano says this, and he puts in scare quotes, this spirit of the council is the license of legitimacy that the innovators oppose to their critics without realizing that it is precisely confessing that legacy that confirms not only to the erroneous of the present declarations, but also the heretical matrix that supposedly justifies them. So is Vigano saying there's a heretical matrix in the council documents or just in the spirit? I think right here he's referring to the spirit. On closer inspection, Never in the history of the church has a council presented itself as such a historic event that it was different from any other council. There was never talk, Vigano says, of the spirit of the council of Nicaea, the spirit of the council of uh, Ferrara Florence, uh, the spirit of the council of Trent, just as we have never had a post-conciliar era after the Fourth Lateran Council or Vatican I. So here Vigano is saying, look, something is different about Vatican II because those who push it, these modernists who are working in the heretical matrix, they themselves realize that it was a pivot. Even Bishop Barron talks about, well, that was before Vatican II. So even in, in their language, they're saying there was a pivot, there was a change, there was a shift to one side. I'm going to skip a little bit more. Vigano says, significantly, those who maintain the novelty of Vatican II also adhere to the heretical doctrine that places the God of the Old Testament in opposition to the God of the New Testament. We see this, for example, in James Martin. We see, well, that was the God of the Old Testament. Well, wait a second. I thought it was the same God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. As we say, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. So if God was pro-death penalty in Genesis, in Deuteronomy, in Kings, the book of Kings, if he's pro-death penalty there, that means he's pro-death penalty. It's in Paul. Christ says to Pilate, you only have this authority because it's been given to you on high. That is to kill Christ, to exercise the death penalty. Paul in Romans talks about how the king bears the sword, not in vain, but to administer justice. But Francis says, well, now it's a more, I am a more merciful Pope. The death penalty is inadmissible. I know that 60 to 100 popes before me have explicitly articulated approval of the death penalty in the Christian tradition. But I'm changing that. I'm more merciful. I'm updating. I'm modernizing. So he's saying that just as there's sort of this, you know, Old Testament God, New Testament God, there's also the Catholic God of before Vatican II and the Catholic God after Vatican II. And the Catholic God after Vatican II is all about mercy and being chill at liturgy, laid back, confession, not a big deal, penance, fasting. The God of post-Vatican II conciliar era is more chill. He's more merciful. In other words, they're saying it's not only a different religion, it's a different God or it's an updated God. We know better now. 
and the numbers go down. Now, there's a part in here, I just want to mention it because he says that Schneider, uh, Bishop Schneider, shows that in previous councils, there, there are things that we have previously let go of. And he says, since that's a since that's already happened, there, a precedent has been sent, set, maybe we can do that now with Vatican II. So for example, he says, you know, in the past in councils, there's been an obligation for Jews to wear distinctive clothing in society, uh, to ban Christians serving Muslims or Jewish masters. By the way, the reason for that is because the uh, the Christian uh, housekeepers or nurses um, would often secretly baptize the children of the Muslims or the Jews, which would then bring that child canonically into the Catholic Church and under canon law, made a lot of a lot of problems in previous eras. So he's saying, you know, we've we've changed or relaxed some of those disciplines. Maybe we can do that with the council. Now, it's interesting to see Vigano in conversation with Bishop Schneider here because Vigano disagrees a little bit. He says, no, I don't, I don't think that's the case. These are disciplinary measures. Now, there's one uh, example that Schneider uses, and that is called the Traditio Instrumentorum, the tradition of the instruments. Briefly, uh, Thomas Aquinas and the medieval theologians say that the matter of ordination is not the laying on of hands per se, it's part of it, but the part that specifies the holy order in holy orders, and that, that I mean bishop, priest, deacon, previous generations would have included the minor order, subdeacon in the minor orders, is the handing over of the instrument. So for example, when a priest is ordained, he's given a paten and a chalice by the bishop, and he touches those to receive them. And traditionally, that was seen as the matter, the material element of ordination. Well, Pope Pius XII, who was Pope in the 50s, he in a constitution said, no, it's the laying on of hands. So Schneider's saying, look, there was this ambiguity in the history, and then Pius XII clarified it. So maybe if there's ambiguity in this council, Vatican II, we can have another Pope come and remove or clarify it. Um, and he says, specifically, Schneider hopes this could happen for Dignitatis Humanae. The problem is, Schneider says, is Vatican II was way beyond that. We're not talking about emphasis or... Uh, disciplines, like whether a Christian can serve in the home of a Jew or a Muslim, we're talking about doctrine, the nature of the church, the nature of ecumenism, the nature of synodality, uh, all these kind of things. Now, he also references, this is very smart, Archbishop Vigan, I hope you're watching, the Synod of Pistoia. <laughs> Applause for Archbishop Vigano, because the Synod of Pistoia was against Jan Jansenists. And at this time, this is in the 1780s, 1780s, there were Catholics who wanted to update, modernize Catholicism. Here are some of the things that they wanted to do. They wanted to abolish communion outside of Mass. They wanted vernacular liturgies, not the Latin Mass. This is 1780s. They wanted to abolish prayers in the canon that were said in a whisper. And anything that was, like, for example, the secret, and anything that was whispered, they wanted it out loud. So they wanted the Roman canon and the consecration to be out loud. Just as today, after Vatican II, they stuffed these microphones on the altar so that the priest is, is basically through the PA shouting the prayers. They also wanted to emphasize at the Synod of, uh, uh, of Pistoia the Episcopal collegiality and lowering the status of the Pope basically what today is called synodality, so that the Pope would be more of a figurehead like the Eastern Orthodox say. All of this stuff was condemned by the Catholic Church. And Vigano says, how can these things that were condemned in the set late 1700s suddenly be paraded out in the 1960s and everybody's applauding and saying, yes, this is great. It's a contradiction. He returns to Vatican II. And he talks about the problem of ecumenism. He says, together with numerous council fathers, we thought of ecumenism as a process, an invitation that calls dissidents to the one church of Christ, idolaters and pagans to the one true God, and the Jewish people to the promised Messiah. But from the moment it was theorized at the council commissions, ecumenism was configured in a way 
that it was in direct opposition to the doctrine previous, previously expressed by the magisterium. And then he goes on to talk about John Paul II again. He says, John Paul II, surrounded by charmers, healers, Buddhist monks, imams, rabbis, Protestant pastors, and other heretics, gave proof of the church's ability to summon people together in order to ask God for peace, while the authoritative example of this action initiated a deviant succession of pantheons. Pantheon is a collection of gods, all the gods together, that were more or less official, even to the point of seeing bishops carrying the unclean idol of Pachamama on their shoulders, sacrilegiously concealed under the pretext of being a representation of sacred motherhood. So ecumenism, which he said when he was a young man, they thought, okay, this is an invitation to talk to people of other faith and invite them to believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, the only Lord and Savior. So it was more of a kind of evangelization. But what he saw is that it opened up what he calls a deviant succession of pantheons. Instead of just saying, hey, come learn about Jesus, let's tell you about our Lord Christ. We have all these healers and shamans and rabbis and imams and Buddhists all together. And the Pope's basically saying, do your deal. Here's a church. Here's a Catholic church. Do your pagan rites that are against the first commandment of the Ten Commandments in our presence in our church. And he goes, that leads to what we saw at the end of 2019. The Pachamama wooden idols being paraded in St. Peter's Square, inside St. Peter's, right in front of the altar, where St. Peter the Fisherman is buried. Unbelievable. I'm still in shock over it. Then he says, but if the image of the infernal divinity, he means Pachamama, but if the image of the infernal divinity was able to enter into St. Peter's, this is part of a crescendo, which the other side foresaw from the beginning. Numerous practicing Catholics and perhaps also a majority of Catholic clergy are today convinced that the Catholic faith is no longer necessary for eternal salvation. They believe that the one and triune God revealed to our fathers is the same God as Muhammad. I'm sorry, the same God of, is the same as the God of Muhammad. Already 20 years ago, we heard this repeated from pulpits and Episcopal Cathedra, but recently we hear it being affirmed with emphasis from the highest throne. Who's he referring to? Bergoglio, Pope Francis. Now he gets into the debate that uh, whether the church, uh, the Catholic Church, the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. It's a long argument. I've covered it previously on the channel. I forget the name of the show. I apologize. Um, it's a complicated argument, and it involves Latin. I think it would probably just take me about 15 to 20 minutes. So I might need to come back to that at a certain time. I really want to focus more on, on Vigano's um, argument here, especially as he gets into the Pachamama. So I'm skipping down a couple paragraphs. And he says, uh, for those of you that are new, and haven't followed my channel, or you're maybe not a Catholic, in October of 2019, the Pope brought in wooden idols from the Amazon region. There was a synod on the Amazon region, and they brought in these idols, and they were burning incense and putting them in churches and parading them around. It was full-on idolatry. When they said, well, are these statues of Mary or statues of... They said, no, this is Pachamama. And Pachamama means Mother Earth. It's a Mother Earth goddess. And she's worshipped as a goddess. She's been worshipped as a goddess uh, before Christopher Columbus came to the Americas. It's an indigenous uh, goddess idol of South America. That's Mother Earth. So he says, if the Pachamama, the, mo the Mother Earth idol, could be adored in a church, we owe it to Dignitatis Humanae. Dignitatis Humanae is the Vatican II document. He's talking about religious freedom here and a false dignity of man. If we have the liturgy that is Protestantized and at times even paganized, we owe it to the revolutionary action of Monsignor Annabal Bugnini and to the post-conciliar reforms. Here, he's referring to the Novus Ordo Mass. Um, this was designed by Annabal Bugnini, 
who consulted with Protestants. He's like, how can we make the Catholic Mass more Protestant? What would get you guys coming to our Catholic Mass? What could we do? Like, well, uh, take away saints, uh, talk about Mary less, uh, downplay sacrifice, downplay that uh, you really believe that this is Jesus Christ, that bread tr transubstantiates into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. You do that kind of stuff, we Protestants might show up. Like, oh, okay. So they revised the traditional Latin Mass and they produced a new Mass called the Novus Ordo. And Annabal Bugnini was the guy who head that up. He is most 99% certainty in my mind, a Freemason. And I document why the evidence of why he's a Freemason with footnotes in my book, Infiltration. If you want to learn about Vigano, you want to learn about this history, what we're talking about and how the Mass was changed, in the involvement of Annabal Bugnini, there's a section, a chapter in the book that'll get you caught up on that. So then he goes on and he talks about, um, he says, if we have synodality, we have that because of the bishop conferences and the violation of the Concorda, Concordat in Italy. This is why we have synodality, this new de-emphasis on centrality in the papacy. And let's just let local bishops kind of come up with doctrine on their own to accompany they're local people. So doctrine can change based on geography and based on time. And it's the bishops to discern how to update and to change. And he talks about uh, the Amazonian document. He talks about the, the hard push to have uh, women ordained as clergy and the abolition of clerical celibacy, which has been part of uh, the Catholic tradition since that one great celibate high priest whose name was Jesus Christ. He was the first celibate priest. And St. Paul was a great celibate priest. St. Timothy was a celibate priest. Titus was a celibate priest. St. Luke was a celibate priest. St. Mark was a celibate priest. All the great um, apostles and big shots in the New Testament, celibate priests. It's been with us from the very beginning. Then Vigano says, the council was used to legitimize the most aberrant doctrinal deviations, the most daring liturgical innovations, and the most unscrupulous abuses, all while authority remained silent. Think about it. Think about all the abuse that happens liturgically in the Catholic Church. Do the bishops correct it? Since 1970, how many bishops have corrected uh, liturgical abuse, Eucharistic abuse. Very few. You get a priest up there preaching fiery sermons and getting things going, he gets moved out to the country. He's gone. You get a guy in there, you know, wearing a clown outfit, you know, or he's on a hoverboard or he's got balloons all over the altar and no one says a thing. Particles of the host falling onto the carpet, getting sucked up in a vacuum cleaner. Apparently no big deal. This is a problem. That's not how Catholicism was before the council. People had real respect. Yesterday was the Feast of Corpus Christi. On Twitter, there was going around a video of Corpus Christi procession. I think it was in the 1940s or 50s. Magnificent. These people believed in the real presence of Jesus Christ, they believed that that was not bread. It was God. It was Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. That's what they believed. We got to get back to that. We got to get back to that. Hey, if you're liking this, please like the video. Please share it. Please subscribe. He goes on and he says, among other things, this council has proven, he's talking about second back in council. This council has proven to be the only one that caused so many interpretive problems and so many contradictions with respect to the pre preceding magisterium. While there is not one other council, from the Council of Jerusalem, which is in Acts, to the Council of uh, First Vatican Council, that does not harmonize perfectly with the entire magisterium or that needs so much interpretation. Are there any councils? Where they're like, wait, you just made that up. No. At the Council of Trent, when they said, a man is justified by faith and works. Like, hey, you just made that up. No, it's in James chapter 2. 
is 15 years old at Trent. We believe in the Mass <clears throat> that the Eucharist, is. we discern that that's the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It's been taught. Well, you just made that up. No, it's in 1 Corinthians. Paul says that you should discern it to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Christ says in John 6, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have no life in you. They're not making it up. Everybody recognizes it. But when you come along in the 1960s and you say, well, all religions have a right to worship how they want to worship, a God-given right, people say, whoa, 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 whoa. Previous popes have not stated that. Now, Vigano gives a little bit of a personal history here. And he says, hey, you know, I haven't always um, thought of it this way. He says, I confess it with serenity and without controversy. I was one of the many people who, despite my perplexities and fears, which today have proven to be absolutely legitimate, trusted the authority of the hierarchy with unconditional obedience. He said, yeah, you know, I realize there's sort of some friction here and things don't really make sense in Vatican II, but I'm just going to trust the hierarchy. I'm going to trust the Pope. I'm going to trust Paul VI, John Paul I, John Paul II, Benedict XVI. And I'm going to trust the Cardinals. I'm going to go along because this is God's church. God's not going to let it go off the rails. Now, I'm about to read. I'm going to pause here. Look y'all in the eyes. I'm about to read the most important section in this whole letter. Uh, this is when he talks about Pope Francis, who he here calls... Uh, Bergoglio. And I've read it several times. And I think it kind of, this is, this is the bullseye. This is the central. And he talks about the day that Pope Francis was elected. Now, when a Pope is, here's how, here's how it works for you, For those of you that aren't Catholic or you don't know the Cardinals come together. Now they're called the cardinals. In Latin, cardo means a hinge. So these are the hinge clergy. Uh, when you're a, a priest, you're incarnated in a diocese. That means that's where you belong. You're in that territory. So the cardinals are those that belong to the diocese of Rome, the apostolic see, and that gives them the right to vote for the next pope. They're in, so every cardinal actually has his own parish his own church inside the apostolic see. They're all assigned one. Now, a lot of them don't even go there. They might be the Archbishop of New York's or some other place, but technically they are the, the pastor, the head cleric, or they could be, it gets a little complicated. There's Cardinal deacons too, Cardinal bishops, Cardinal priests, Cardinal deacons, but they have an assignment in Rome. They come together after the death of a Pope or apparently after a resignation and they vote. They can elect any baptized Catholic male who's not a heretic. Usually they choose one of their own, a cardinal. When the election happens, they burn, the white smoke goes up, and that tells everybody there's gonna there's a pope, Habemos Papam. Until the man says, I accept it, he's not the Pope. So they could uh vote on Cardinal Cardinal Smith, and that he wins the election, but he's not yet Pope. They go up to Cardinal Smith and say, Cardinal Smith. You have been elected by the College of Cardinals. Do you accept the papacy? When he says, I accept it, he's the Pope. He's the Pope. Now what happens next is he gets to choose a name, which he has to submit right then. And then he goes to what's called the Room of Tears. The Room of Tears is next to the Sistine Chapel. That's where they do the election. You know, the famous Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo. That's where they elect the Pope. He takes him to the Room of Tears and they dress him in the papal vestments, the garb, the white cassock, the mozetta, the stole, all this stuff. And it's called the Room of Tears because usually the man has a good cry. Uh, probably because of the immense stress that's laid upon him. He's now the Pope. He's now the chief uh, pastor on earth, the Vicar of Christ, as we Catholics believe. So here is what Vigano says regarding this in the Room of Tears and Francis. Are you ready? Here we go. In the Room of Tears, this is Vigano. In the Room of Tears, adjacent to the Sistine Chapel, while Monsignor Guido Marini prepared the white uh, rochetto, the mazetta, and the stole for the first appearance of the newly elected Pope, Berg, newly elected Pope, 
Bergoglio exclaims, Sono fite le carnavalate. The carnivals are over. I'm going to pause here. So they brought Bergoglio into the Room of Tears. He was setting out all the papal stuff, and Bergoglio's like, the carnival's over. I'm not going to dress up. We're not going to put on all this pomp. I'm going to dumb things down. Now, here's the interesting part of this letter by Vigano. I, I think I prepped it before. Let me see if I still have it here. Yep. Uh, yeah, here it is. This is the text. In the Room of Tears, and y'all can see it, it's it's on, the, on your left side of the screen. In the Room of Tears, adjacent to the Sistine Chapel, while Monsignor Guido Marini prepared the white Rochetto, is it Rochetto or Rochetto? I'm from Texas, I don't know. Mazetta, uh, Mazetta and Stoll for the first appearance of the newly elected Pope. Vigano, there are scare quotes right here. What does this mean? Newly elected. But if I said, yeah, the newly elected Pope, what's meant here? Is Vigano casting doubt? on the election of Bergoglio. If you're in the comments, what do you think? So then I was like, well, maybe the Italian, the original Italian is different. By the way, this was uh, translated, translated by Giuseppe Pellegrino. So then a friend of mine got me the Italian. And the Italian, as you can see, is below the English on the left side of your screen. And there it says, Neo Eletto. Neo, Neo, New, Eletto, elected. And looky, looky, scare quotes. So what is Vigano saying here? Is he ca casting doubt on the election of the Pope? Then he goes on to say, Bergoglio uh, exclaimed, Sonofite la, and so on. And he names him Bergoglio. So I'm just kind of wondering, you know, I did the, the show last week with uh, Dr. Maza and then the one before that. And we've been talking about, did Benedict fully resign? Did he partially resign? Did he fully resign? How do we understand the role of Francis? Is he an anti-pope? Is he the real pope? Is he just Bishop of Rome? Stripped away of the primacy? That's what Dr. Maza says. Just kind of going through these ideas. I hold that Francis is the putative pope. I would love if he somehow were not, and we could just unwind Amoris, unwind Abu Dhabi, unwind Pachamama, unwind some of these canonizations. That's, oh, that would feel good. But I don't think that we can say, well, we know Benedict is the Pope, or we know Francis is not the Pope, or that he was the Pope, but he's no longer the Pope because of heresy, or the election was invalid, because we're Catholics and we go by decrees, not personal opinion. So we live in this, this is my opinion, we live in this uneasy time of not knowing what conclusion to make. We have to wait. We have to be quiet before the Lord and wait with patience to figure this out. But I think it's, you know, if I could ask Archbishop Vigano, and maybe he'll see this or maybe someone can pass it on to Archbishop Vigano, why the scare quotes on newly elected? Is, are you telling us something here? Are you casting doubt on the election of Bergoglio? So then he goes on and then he says, uh, Bergoglio exclaimed, the carnivals are over scornfully refusing the insignia that all the popes until then had humbly accepted as distinguishing the garb of the vicar of Christ. But those words contained truth, even if it was spoken involuntarily. For on March 13, 2013, the mask fell from the conspirators who were finally free from the inconvenient presence of Pope Ben XVI and brazenly, brazenly proud of having finally succeeded in promoting a cardinal who embodied their ideals their way of revolutionizing the church, of making doctrine malleable, morals adaptable, liturgy adulterable, and discipline disposable. I think, my opinion here is that Archbishop Vigano is referring to the permanent instruction, instruction of Alta Vendita. Uh, it's the opening chapters of my book, Infiltration, and I publish the whole thing in English in the back. In that document, which is a secret society document on how to infiltrate the church from the 1840s, in that permanent instruction, the Alta Vendita, it discusses finding, a, setting a pope in their own image with their own ideals of humanism and plurality of religions. 
And it speaks of a revolution in Tierra and Cope. And so I see two phrases there by Vigano, both the revolution and also of them promoting a cardinal who embodies those ideals. Though that language there, those two phrases there are very close to what's said in the Alta Vendita. So I think Vigano may have that in mind. I don't know. I know uh, Vigano has read Infiltration and he said something very kind about it. Thank you, Archbishop Vigano. But having worked on that document and then reading this, I, I sense an echo. I sense an echo. Then he says, and all this was considered by the protagonists of the conspiracies themselves, the logical consequence and obvious application of Vatican II, which according to them has been weakened by the critiques expressed by Bennett the Sixteenth. Skipping just a line, it is no accident that Bergoglio's supporters are the same people who saw the council as the first event of a new church, prior to which there was an old religion with the old liturgy. Here we're seeing the new versus the old. Traditional Latin Mass, Novus Ordo, the new order. And it's no surprise that Bergoglio and his men want the new, want the new. And we also hear uh, Archbishop Vigano saying the old Mass, traditional he says, it is no accident that these men affirm with impunity, scandalizing moderates, is what Catholics also believe, namely, that despite all the efforts of the hermeneutic of continuity, which shipwrecked miserably at the first confrontation with the reality of the present crisis, is, it is undeniable that from Vatican II onwards, a parallel church was built superimposed over and diametrically opposed to the true church of Christ. Whoa. Whoa. A parallel church. Now, before I move on here, he, he, he says that once Francis comes on the scene, the hermeneutic of continuity is over. And I shared this picture last week. Here's a picture of the hermeneutic continuity. Remember, hermeneutic continuity is hermeneutic interpretation continuity with the past. So yeah, v uh, Vatican II has all this weird stuff in it, but we can interpret it in continuity with the past and therefore turn it orthodox, even though it sounds heretical. And then someone created this image here and you see the back part of the horse is beautifully drawn, great artwork. And then the front part is a stick figure of a horse. Now you could look at this and say, well, yeah, that's a horse. But, and you could say, yeah, the, the front half is in continuity with the back half, hermeneutic continuity. But it's clear, isn't it, that these are two different artists and that the back half is definitely different than the front half? We could argue all day as art scholars that there's continuity with the back half to the front half, but we all know it's a sham. We all know. And this is what Vigano is saying. That the hermeneutic of continuity, what did he say? The hermeneutic, this is a quote, Vigano. The hermeneutic of continuity, which shipwrecked miserably at the first confrontation with the reality of the present crisis, meaning Francis. So that's the hermeneutic of continuity. He then says, and we're getting towards the end. We're getting towards the end here. This parallel church progressively obscured the divine institution founded by our Lord in order to replace it with the spirit a spurious entity corresponding to the desired universal religion that was first theorized by Masonry. Talking about the Freemasons. The Freemasons want all religions to be equal. To them, Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, Taoist, animist, all the same thing. Jesus Christ is not unique to the Freemasons. He talks about this drive for a Abrahamic worship center where Christians, Jews, and Muslims can worship together. And he talks about how this is a Masonic plan to subvert Christianity, to subvert Christ, to enter into an era of the Antichrist. It may be that the Antichrist isn't just, I hate Jesus Christ. It might just be, well, he's just kind of, Jesus is just kind of one of many. He's not special. That's Antichrist. 
In fact, the Bible says, 1 John, anyone who doesn't accept that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and has come in the flesh and is God, that's Antichrist. It's against Christ. All right, well, that's the, that's the letter. Uh, he says much more. I'd encourage everybody to go read it. It's published in many places. Uh, I think LifeSite uh, has probably the easiest way to, to find it and to read it. Just go to LifeSite. on the front page today. Uh, just a couple conclusions and we'll sign off. We see that Vigano has taken a shot at Vatican II. We are seeing more and more Catholics, myself included, traditionalists saying, okay, we tried, hermeneutic continuity, shipwrecked. I've only been thinking this really for the past two and a half, three years, where I'm like, hermeneutic continuity, let me put it back up here. I'm, I'm finding like, okay, it's two different artists, Let's just get on with it. <laughs> I like the artist on the back side of the horse, not the front side of the horse. Let's go back to that really nice drawing. Let's go back to, you know, traditional moral theology. Let's go back to traditional seminary formation. Let's go back to the traditional Latin mass, traditional Roman baptism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's get back to that. So he's taking shots at Vatican II. He's taking shots at the hermeneutic of continuity. And then he's also saying that those who are sided with Pope Francis are definitely on the, the, the team that says there's a new religion a new era, a new Catholicism, a new morality, a new way of being church. And that's a problem because Catholics believe that Catholicism can never change. It's perennial. We believe in the deposit of faith. That means Jesus with the 12 apostles deposited all the doctrines and all the morality in a treasury a deposit of faith. And until Jesus comes back again, not one jot or tittle. You can't take five bucks out of it. You can't put five in. You can't take one penny out. It has to stay intact until the end of time. So when you have a pope and bishops saying things that are different than before, it's like they're fiddling with the deposit of faith, adding and taking away. It can't be that way. And it's great to see Somebody just shoot straight. Somebody who has Archbishop in front of his name. Thank you, Archbishop Vigano. It's like somebody finally says, guys, the emperor, he's naked. He doesn't have any clothes on. I was like, thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. So the, my final point here is I think his impact in writing President Trump and warning him of infiltration in the church and in the state I think he took this opportunity while he was in the limelight to kind of come out and say, look, I used to be trying to make this hermeneutic continuity work. And I've realized now because of the current crisis, it's shipwrecked. We need now to take a responsible critique of the Second Vatican Council. And as I say in my book, Infiltration, Paul VI said Vatican II is not infallible. It's a pastoral council. It did not intend to be dogmatic. Yes, I know there's a dogmatic constitution, but when the Pope says it wasn't supposed to be dogmatic and it's not infallible, that means that this council, and we all admit this council is an unusual council. There's an asterisk out next to it. It's time for us to figure out how this works. And can we just reject all the documents or do we line item veto the problematic passages? That I don't know. That I'm working on myself. That I would love to hear Vigano talk about that. So I'm going to close up there and uh, I'm going to close this in prayer. We're going to pray in a, a Hail Mary, Ave Maria, and we're going to pray the Glory Be, the Gloria Patri. We're going to pray it for Archbishop Vigano because I think he's doing a lot of good and he's going to be under attack from within the church and without the and from outside the church. And the demons are going to be all after him. He's living in hiding. So we're going to pray for Archbishop Vigano. Before I do, I want to say, Make sure you're praying the rosary every day. You've got to pray the rosary every day. You might be surprised about rosary. That's just repeating prayers, beads. What is that? The rosary is 150 prayers broken into 15 sections of 10 prayers or 10 beads each. We call each of those 10 a decade, a 10. 
And there are 15 things, mysteries that we think about while we're praying through these 150 beads. And they follow the life of Christ from his incarnation in the womb of Mary all the way to the eschatological glory of crowning, which we talk about in the crowning of Our Lady, which all of us, it says, Paul says, we'll all receive crowns if we make it to heaven. So that's what the rosary is. It's praying while we meditate and think about the life and work of Jesus Christ and his teachings. So the rosary was given in the 1200s to a saint named St. Dominic. He was fighting the Albigensian heresy. Mary says, hey, this is the angelic Psalter. There's 150 Psalms. Here's the 150 prayers with the 15 mysteries. With this weapon, you will destroy all the heresies. And so Dominic took that and the Dominican order took that and spread it throughout the world. We still pray it today. Saints say the rosary. Popes say the rosary. The Blessed Virgin Mary appeared in 1917 at Fatima. She said, pray the rosary every day. So if you don't pray the rosary, you're not on the team. Pray the rosary every single day. All right, we're going to close up here. I'm going to lead us in a Hail Mary and a Glory Be for Archbishop Vigano. Before I do, would you please, please do me the honor and the favor of liking the video. Hit the thumbs up. I would truly appreciate that. When you hit the thumbs up in YouTube, it tells YouTube, hey, I like this video. Show it to some other people. They might like it too. So if you hit that thumbs up, you help YouTube show this video to other people. I think this is a pretty good video today. Also, hit the share button. Share it on Facebook. That gets people amongst your friends and your family. They'll see it on Facebook. They'll come over and they'll watch it. So that gets us outside the YouTube circle. And then if you want to keep getting more videos, make sure that you subscribe and hit the notification on and you'll get notified every time I do a video. Historically, I've done videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Lately, I've been doing them five days a week because there's so much good news. I do them at random times. Might be at, I don't know, two, three o'clock on Friday afternoon. If you're a subscriber, you'll be notified and you can come join us live. And then today and a few days ago, I've been getting tons of support. And I want to thank everybody who is supporting my channel on Patreon. I don't deserve this. It's amazing. So many people have been rallying this channel in the last couple of weeks. I think they like the live uh, format and giving all this information. And so they've been supporting me on Patreon and I do things to say thank you. I send you signed books. I have eight books. Um, I think at a certain level, I sign almost all of them and send them to you uh, and other cool things, merchandise benefits. So uh, if you like, please support the channel. I truly would appreciate it. And I'll sign the books and my wife, Joy, takes them down and, and, and mails them to everybody. And you can learn more at patreon.com forward slash Dr. Taylor Marshall. That's D-R Taylor Marshall. All right, let's pray. Oremos. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et et ora mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri, et Filio, et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Well, thanks everybody for watching. God bless you. Pray the rosary every day. Pray for Vigano. Read the Bible. Get to know your faith. Read the traditional catechisms. Get a Baltimore catechism. And remember that our Lord Jesus Christ said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. Have a blessed weekend. And we'll see you probably Sunday afternoon or Monday. Till then, Godspeed and God bless.